Hello everybody, welcome to ECMATH. Today we're going to talk about parametric equations. This is actually one of my favorite topics. I think they're really cool, uh, and I think they're really useful. So I'm going to start the video with just a little bit uh, talking about what parametric equations are good for before we get into the algebra of what they are. So if you've ever seen videos of uh, factory robots, you've worked with parametric equations. Um, we'll talk about why in a second. If you've ever seen videos with 3D printer, you've worked with parametric equations. Or if you've ever actually 3D printed something, you've definitely worked with parametric equations. If you have ever been to a concert that has lights that move like this, that make the concert really pretty, you've seen parametric equations in action. Uh, what else? Have you ever uh, played sports? We'll talk about all these. Have you ever played sports? Have you ever mapped your route on Google Maps? Have you ever solved the high dive problem in math class? If any of these are true, you've already done some stuff with parametric equations, you just didn't know it yet. So what's the big deal about parametric equations? Uh, what do they do? Why are they useful? Well, so the idea of a parametric equation is that in real life, most things aren't just functions x and y in terms of x. Uh, life is more complicated than just y in terms of x. It's in multiple dimensions. But also, we live in something called time, right? Like things change over time. And if you think about a normal function, you know, y equals x squared, that's just the whole parabola is there the whole time. It doesn't really encode anything about movement. And, you know, if you think, oh, math is good for physics, well, what happens in physics? Movement. What do all these things do? Uh, you know, robots and lights and moving lights uh, and 3D printers, they move. And parametrics are kind of the motion, in a sense, of movement. Um, this picture of a 3D printer is, I think, a perfect one because you can really see that it has three independent axes of movement. You can notice that this, uh, this is the print head, by the way, that will be printing this little cool octopus. Um, this print head can move left and right. I don't know what axes the software calls this, but I'm going to say that this is maybe the X direction. Um, the print head can move up and down on this axis. Maybe we'll call that uh, vertical. So I don't think they call that Z. Z is usually the vertical axis. And in this particular printer, the print head can't move forward and backwards. But what does move forward and backwards, and I think this is super cool, is the actual print bed. And it's if effectively the same as if the print head moved forward and backward. And that might be called the Y axis. I know that's kind of a weird orientation, but that's probably how they do it. Um, Here's a picture. There's other 3D printers. This is the one like we have in the actual school library. Uh, and here the print head is able to move left and right and forward and back. And then the bed actually moves up and down. But regardless of how they do it, they have three independent axes of movement. And the software and the challenge of the software is actually figuring out where does this print head need to be at any given time to print the design that is needed. And that's what's really working uh, here when we think about 3D printing is, is movement on independent axes with a hidden parameter of time. If you've ever seen these little Amazon factory robots, they work in much the same way. They, they uh, are like little uh, Roombas type of thing. Very cool videos if you haven't seen them. Whether, no matter what you think about Amazon and factories, uh, there's some cool technology in the robot themselves. Um, and these guys don't even have a front. They can move like this, and they can just immediately go and start going that way um, on the floor. And right, they don't even have to turn. They just go left, they go right. I think they have you know little sets of wheels that are crossways patterns, so they can go left, right, or, or whatever. And they're programmed to pick up the little shelves and carry them over to the pickers so they can get uh, boxed. Moving lights, same idea. These might actually be maybe like a polar parametric. They can control one axis and then you can control another axis of spin so you have two kind of controls independently and the cool uh, person in the back of the auditorium on the light board has two little sliders there's probably maybe software but there's two little sliders one that controls each axis of spin and that's how you point those moving lights and get them to synchronize and and blink at the right time and be in the right spot to highlight Justin Bieber and you know all the important things in life um, so that's what's going on with parametric equations is you have independent movement in terms of time. Um, another way to think about it is, you know, I talked about sports, and I don't play sports, but I've, I've seen sports movies, 
Uh, and I know that often they'll diagram their plays out like this. Now, if I was walking in here and it looks, I look at it, I would say, man, these players, they don't seem very smart. It looks like they're going to crash into each other, right? They're going to, this guy in blue is going to hit, uh, make three big collisions. Now, obviously, uh, unless you're watching a bad sports team, um, when I could name a couple, but I'm not going to, unless you're watching a bad sports team, they won't crash into each other. They're going to avoid each other. Why? Well, because even though this diagram shows that they're going to be in the same place, they're going to be in the same place at different times. And so the time that it takes for something to happen is actually really important. It keeps your players from hitting each other. Um, same deal here, right? Like if you look at this map of, I don't know, this is just something I found on Google, uh, someone driving around somewhere. Uh, this person wasn't in all of these places at all of these times. And in fact, they had an entire list of where they were. And also, I think this is saying when they were there. And then the map is connecting the dots to create this time series data. You, by the way, um, if you've been traveling recently, you can usually, and you have a, an Android phone at least, you can go to maps.google.com and view your own location history, and it shows you a map like this. It's maybe a little bit creepy and weird, uh, but it's also kind of interesting. Um, of course, if you've been staying home a lot recently, then it will be a pretty boring map. Um, and, you know, going back to our little demo, uh, we'll play it now. You've seen this if you've been in our math class before. Um, right? We, we're trying to uh, launch a person off a Ferris wheel. And what you may be seeing this animation, but if you really thought about what's going on, you might actually notice that there's a hidden variable, a hidden time parameter. When I press start, look at this. Ooh, here, use my mouse. Look at the slider that changes, right? This T slider is going to change. And everything in the whole problem depends on T. I programmed this a couple years ago. And honestly, I don't know if I could program it now. I've, I've forgotten a lot of the, the language that I use, but. Everything was dependent on this T slider, and as that T slider changes, everything like relies on it. And that's the power of parametrics, is they're also really good for, for programming. This is a simple program, but more complicated programs do the same thing as well. Okay, so parametrics are really cool, they're really useful, they're important in just kind of life and and any kind of technology, you're gonna use them. They're important in calculus. So what do you do? How do you deal with them? What what in the world are they? So the basic idea of parametrics is that you're going to have a set of two equations instead of one. And those two equations are going to create what kind of looks like a piecewise function, but it's really just a multi-part function. So instead of having just x and y, we say, all right, we're going to devise a parameter and it's going to be called t. And t is going to take the role of the input. And then we're going to create a function in terms of x and a separate function in terms of y that are going to represent the outputs. And so we could write f of t equals this multi-part function, and then the x equation will give you the x-coordinate, and the y equation will give you the y-coordinate. Um, often, I think, in calculus, I know we use the, the, the letter r instead of f, y, I don't know, maybe for parameterization, um, but you'll also see that too. So here's an example of a parametric function like you might see in your book. Um, they'll say, here is the parameter or the input, t, That's in the, they'll tell you its name. They'll often give you a bound on t. They'll say negative 1 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 3. It is important, of course, that you make sure it's, you know, whether it's less than or equal or strictly less than, that, that is a difference. This one is less than or equal to it. It mostly will be. And then they'll give you this equation. You know, say r of t equals x of t. So r of t equals, and then it splits into two, and you say, here's x of t, which is going to be 2t, and here's y of t, which is going to be t squared. So you can kind of imagine that, uh, well, I don't know, let's just do it. We're going to make a table. Now this is going to be an interesting in-out table, because it's going to have three columns. So it's going to have an in column that's going to be t, but the out column it's going to be actually in two pieces. It's going to have the x and then the y. And let's actually write that is. And then you can kind of imagine there's like a hidden, I don't know, stopwatch. That's a stopwatch, believe me. Uh, that represents t. That's going to kind of like tick forwards. And every time t ticks forwards one, you plot a different x, y point. So our directions are saying t starts at negative 1. When t is negative 1, 
x is 2 times that, or negative, we'll do it, uh, so 2 times negative 1, which you know is negative 2, and y is negative 1 squared, which you know is 1. What that's going to translate to is the point negative 2, positive 1. So we have this connection where x and y then correlate with a point. Uh, from here, you just kind of fill out the in-out table, so I'm going to uh, kind of do that. Now when I go to graph these, you imagine that each of these xy pairs, and you can write it like this if you want, just turns directly into a point that's going to appear on your graph. Um, so what do we do? How do we graph it? Well, let's just make ourselves some space, and you just make this plot. And so we're going to plot all of those points that we see. And once you've plotted the points, you can start to connect them with a smooth curve. So I'm going to connect them in this direction. It helps, by the way. We're going to teach you how, how to know that this curve really is a parabola. Uh, I should have got a little more of a parabolic shape on there, but you know you can't always be perfect, so oops. Um, but here's what's actually really important about a parametric curve. We're not done. I do have my start point, and I have my end point. But on the actual curve, you must also include some little arrows. And I just draw them like little you know, wedges on the actual curve that indicate the direction of travel. And how do you know the direction of travel? Well, the direction of travel is always from the starting point to the ending point. Uh, but the reason you do that is that when you present your final answer or whatever, or you're, you're giving us a graph in a, a paper or presentation, you might not include the, the in-out table, you might just show the graph. And so the graph kind of needs to include all the information, which means the start and the end um, points. And by the way, the start and end points were determined by the boundary that was given on T originally. Um, so to make the graph in general, you look at your parameterization, you look at your T, you make an in-out table, you plot the points, you connect them in order, and then you show the direction. Um, and if you're ever at a point where you're like, man, I wish I had more data. I'm not sure like what's going on right there. You're always allowed to plot values of t in between. So you could, for example, plot t equals 2.5 and figure out what the coordinates of that would be. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I guess it would be, yeah, it would be kind of annoying with the squared. Um, but you could definitely plot extra values of t, make as many values as you feel like you need. Uh, for example, you know, don't go too few. For example, if I just plotted the starting and ending points, I might be tempted to connect, you know, if I just had these two points, I might be tempted to connect them with a line, and that would be an error. So you have to do enough points that, that you know what the shape is, but you, you know, do, do a good happy medium, I would say, in terms of number of points. All right, let's look at another graph. Oh, I actually want to give you a little notation note first. That's right. Um, so in multivariable calculus, which is another class I teach, uh, parametrics are also thought of as vector functions. We've talked about vectors in our class before too, right? Vectors are a little arrow that goes from the origin to a point. You can kind of think about vectors like a point, but they're also useful because they encode things like direction and magnitude and speed. And we're talking about parametrics, which are also useful for ideas of direction and magnitude and speed. So, um, for example, in multivariable calculus, instead of writing the same function above as like r of t equals and making like a little piecewise function, we actually just write it like a vector. We say, all right, here's our, per our function, and it's going to be written as a vector with little vector brackets, and we know that the first part of the vector is x, and the second part of the vector is y, and so the x, y is just encoded by its position in the vector. That makes things a little more nice. It's another notation you'll sometimes see, and another thing that's useful is it makes it easier to calculate uh, things like r prime of t, which is a calculus idea that shows you the velocity vector at any point on the path. So if you're thinking about the function as a vector, you're thinking about this path, obviously at any point, there's going to be some kind of velocity vector tangent to the path uh, that shows you, you know, what the uh, kind of general speed and direction of, of a car driving on that parabola would be. And, and it's easy to calculate if you have that r prime of t, which is easy to calculate if you know calculus and you have the parameterization this way. So that's just a fun calculus fact for next year. Okay.
what if we wanted to prove that that was a parabola without plotting all the points? Uh, it's There is something that you can do called eliminating the parameter. And by eliminating the parameter, you are able to determine what kind of rectangular graph or XY graph this can be. Now I will note, you can't always do this. Uh, if the graph that it ends up described is not a function of X in terms of Y, and you're trying to like make get rid of t and make it in terms of x and y it's not going to work now the one that we just graphed is a parabola we kind of suspect it probably should work so here's what you do instead of writing it like a piecewise function or a vector function you just turn it into kind of a system of equations so we write x equals 2t and y equals t squared and our basically my goal is to use substitution uh, and maybe other algebra, so I'll just say substitution and algebra, to eliminate t and solve for y. So that I can get something of the nice form y equals blah 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 blah. Now the usual trick for this is you pick the simplest of the equation, and in this case I'm going to say this is the simplest, and I solve it for t. So I would write it as x over 2 equals t. Solving that simple one for t just because it, it is nice. And then t has to be kind of the same t in both equations. So I'm going to take that x over 2 expression for t and substitute it in to the y equation. And write what I'll write is that y is equal to x over 2 squared. And now I'm actually done, but let me simplify this a little bit more. Uh, that would be like x squared over 4, or if it helps you, 1 fourth x squared. And, you know, you could think about it. What does the equation y equals 1 fourth x squared look like? Well, it looks like a parabola. So, and it, it's a parabola that's been uh, squished down by a factor of 4, so that it kind of is a little shorter and, and fatter than other, uh, or I should say shorter than other parabolas. It's not fatter. That would be an x transformation. Um, but one thing I think that's interesting is, you know, people get really excited, oh, like, why do I need parametrics? Can I just eliminate the parameter? Uh, and the answer is no, because when you do this, you lose information. The information you've lost is uh, the starting and end points, and also the direction. And if you imagine someone driving along that path, you've also lost information about their speed. So the only thing you really get from this, the only thing this actually tells you is the shape. And you can, of course, use this uh, idea of eliminating the parameter to make nice graphs, but you do lose a lot of that nice information from the parametrics. So that's why, um, you know, we still do parametrics and we don't just eliminate the parameter all the time. So what if we uh, had a different parametric and this parametric is x equals t squared and y equals t. Uh, let's go ahead and eliminate. So I'm going to approach this maybe backwards, uh, but I think it's going to try to show you something. So let's eliminate the parameter. Uh, so I'll write x equals t squared and y equals t. <laughs> now if you know have just y equals t, it's easy to directly substitute into the other equation. So when you have x equals t or y equals t, eliminating the parameter is basically trivial. Uh, since y is t, then you could substitute and have x equals y squared or x equals y squared. Now, uh, in this case, this is an example of a eliminated parameter rectangular equation that we got that I don't know what it looks like. I could guess, of course, but I don't know. And so this is one of the values of parametrics. So this is going to let us, uh, we can use the idea that this is kind of the general shape, but I'm not going to go back and make my in out table. So here I'm going to go look at my t bounds again. I'm going to make my in to make my out. My in is t, my out is x equals t squared, and y equals t. t is supposed to go from negative 2, so I'm going to do negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. That's going to be 4. It's sometimes easier to go down a full column just because you kind of get into the rhythm, uh, so that's going to be 1, 0, 1, and 4, and y equals t, I guess that's the same. So then I'm going to plot the points in order like this. Boom, 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 boom. It's 
It's important to remember what was the starting point and the ending point, because when you connect them, you're going to connect them with that smooth curve from the start to the end, including the direction of travel. So I'm traveling from the starting point to the ending point. And this is the correct graph here. And you can see that, you know, this would not be a function uh, x in terms of y. It fails that vertical line test. So that's uh, one value of parametrics is it's really easy to parametrize things that aren't actually functions. If I did want to think about this graph uh, in terms of a function of y, what I'd have to do is do the plus or minus square root of x equals y. And you can't actually see that this is like uh, plus root x and this part is like minus root x. But then you definitely kind of lose the start and end property of the, the whole situation. So eliminating the parameter can kind of tell you a little bit, but actually the table and the graph tell you a lot more. Another very popular parametric has to do with trig. And that's why we teach, uh, we don't teach this at the start of the year, is because we want you to know a little bit of trig before we get into parametric time. Uh, so it kind of actually is a really beautiful topic to end the year because it brings a little bit of everything to bear. Um, so here we're not given bounds on t. I'm going to assert bounds on t for this problem. And I'm going to do that because I know that sine and cosine repeat every 2 pi. So if I went beyond that, I would just be repeating myself. Uh, so I'm going to say, all right, here's my in. Here's my out. I'm going to have t. I'm going to have x equals cosine t. y equals sine t. Now, I'm thinking about cosine and sine. I don't have to just be blind and go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That would be actually kind of silly in this case because I'm going to be plugging values into cosine and sine that I don't want to plug into cosine and sine. So instead, let's do 0, and then let's do pi over 2, and then pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, which I know is the same as 0. And I'm going to see if that gives me enough information to plot what I need to plot. Uh, so cosine of 0 is 1, then it goes to 0, then it's negative 1, 0, and back to 1. Sine starts at 0, goes to 1, goes to 0, is at negative 1, and then back to 0. Uh, go watch some Chapter 4 videos or consult your unit circle if you want to uh, get some help with that. Okay, so let's go plot these out. I'm resisting the urge to just pause the video and plot all the points because I do actually think it's important for you to see the points be plotted. Um, I'm going to make my scale a little larger. It's important for you to see the points be plotted in order because parametrics are all about order. So the first point I'm going to plot is 1, 0, then 0, 1, then negative 1, 0, then 0, negative 1, and then back to 1, 0. So if we connect them in a, in a smooth curve, well, what do you think this is going to look like? Obviously, I've got four dots here. I didn't do any intermediate points. I don't quite know. Uh, now you might say, well, then, Mr. Eck, it's obviously a square because four corners make a square. But I would argue to you that let's think about what we're actually doing. We're looking at cosine. We're looking at sine. This, my friends, is going to be a circle. Let's see if we can draw a good circle. And it's going to be a circle with rotational motion in the counterclockwise direction. And it's going to continue, you know, we said from 0 to 2 pi, which we did do, but it would continue forever and ever if you didn't have those bounds on t. You might be like, wow, that's so cool. I didn't know you could make a circle that way. Uh, yeah, you totally can. The high dive animation I showed you earlier, when I said I programmed it with parametrics, this is the parameterization that I used. I used uh, cosine t and sine t with a little bit of transformation to create the, uh, the Ferris wheel. And furthermore, let's see if this will open. When you did that high dive unit and you learned about the Ferris wheels, you may have seen and you learned how the Ferris wheel created the sine and cosine graphs. You may have seen this animation. Uh, this is just from Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. Um, you may have seen this animation where it shows how the circle creates the sine and cosine graphs. Well, what we just kind of did is reverse the animation. We said, okay, here's a sine graph, here's a cosine graph, assign each of these to x or y, and when you put them together and let time play, it actually creates the circle. So if you can kind of imagine that graph that you've maybe seen before, switch your brain the other way, 
It's actually drawing the circle from those graphs, and that's why it creates a circle in the way that it does. Let's look at another interesting parameterization. Uh, it's x is negative cosine t and y is negative sine t. And let's see what happens. So uh, because I'm dealing with cosine and sine, I'm actually just going to take, there they are, the values I had before and alter them slightly. So if x is now negative cosine t and y is negative sine t, that's just going to change the sine of everything. I know negative zero is just zero, but I'm doing it for effect. It's going to change the sign of everything. And then let's see what happens here. So this is where it's important to pay really close kind of attention to the parameterization. I'm starting at now the point negative 1, 0. So I'm going to say, I'm going to just do S for start. Uh, then I go to 0, negative 1. So 0, negative 1. I go to 1, 0 still. I go to 0, 1. And then I go back to negative 1, 0. So this would be a parameterization of the same circle. That's not very circly. In the same direction, but with a different starting and ending point, which is something that you might want if you were, uh, you know, like if you're just looking at the graph, you don't really care about the starting and ending point. You've got a nice circle. But if you were programming a robot, to travel in a circle, or you're programming a moving light to right, highlight your actor that's going around in a circle, it might be important to have them be able to start on stage left or stage right and be able to, to have that control. And that's something that a parameterization can do, is, is by changing just a little piece, you can change the, how the whole thing works. Uh, you can also, I think, by making this uh, cosine negative t sine negative t. I think that's a good way to change the direction if you wanted the light to go the other way. So you can mess around with the starting point, ending point. If you switch sine and cosine, then zeros and ones gets flipped and your starting and ending points can be on the, on the y-axis. Um, and it's just going to make a circle, but it does kind of help uh, being able to control the points. And it's not that hard for you to just play around with it, right? So kind of say, hey, let me play with this parameterization. Let me switch the sine, switch the cosine. Let's put some stuff in there and plot it out, and it's all just zeros and ones. So um, you're just kind of switching the arrangement of zeros and ones, and you can get all kinds of cool graphs. And I think right now would be an opportune moment for me to show you how to do these param parametrics in Desmos, and maybe in your calculator as well. So uh, hold on, I'm juggling my computer screen and my keyboard and everything. Uh, so open up desmos.com forward slash calculator. And you're in this nice menu, and this is where you know your y equals x squared and all that good good jazz. If you want to do a parametric, here's how you have to do it. You can't just write x of t, I believe, unless they've changed it. You can't just write x of t equals t and y of t equals 3, uh, because it interprets it as two separate equations. So you have to have a way to put it into a single. And the way you do it as a single equation is kind of, you know, how we talked about you can write a parametric as a vector equation. You can also think about a parametric as just a set of points. So you make a point, x comma y. But what if I put a function in terms of x and y? So like, all right, a general point is x and y, and it's not going to like that because it's, there's no relationship. What if you write uh, t comma t squared? Desmos at this point says, oh my gosh, guys, you must be doing a parametric. Here's the graph of t times t squared. And it usually puts bounds on t, just guesses like 0 to 1. It just guessed, and you could then from your problem say, no, I want it to go from negative 1 to 4, and that would be your parameterization. I think the one we did first was t comma, uh, it was 2t comma t squared, and you can see how that 2t changes the shape. Uh, it kind of correlated to like a little uh, vertical shrink of the parabola. So that's how you do this on Desmos, but I wanted to show you, not this one, that's boring, but I want to show you the trig one. So you can do cosine t comma sine t. And then you really do have to tell Desmos that you want to go from 0 to 2 pi. You can just type pi for the pi. And there you have your circle. And again, Desmos doesn't actually tell you the starting and ending points or the direction. I, I love how it deals with parametrics, but it's, it's flawed in that. You can get a sense of the direction by putting like a slider in for the upper bound. That's something that's really nice. So you can say, okay, now uh, the upper bound is like a letter K. You can change K and watch the thing be drawn. That's a little advanced Desmos trick. Um, I'm going to get rid of that and just put this back. What I, I want to show you the value of parametrics, right? Um, 
what if I took the same thing and made this 2 sine t? So that is, I'm changing the amplitude of just the vertical, right? I'm making it 2 sine t. Check this out. Whoa there. Uh, whoa there. That's a triple whoa. Let's try that again. Oh my gosh, look, you've got an ellipse. You still have the same properties that are making you have a circle, but now you're stretching the vertical. What if I wanted to stretch the horizontal? Oh look, now I have an ellipse that has a, a, a semi-major axis length of 5 and a semi-minor axis length of 2, which is uh, pretty easy if you remember from Math 3 or whenever you learned ellipses, or maybe later or earlier in this class. Ellipses and rectangular coordinates are all kinds of gross. You've got to do some. You've got to complete the square. You've got to uh, solve. You've got to divide. You've got to do some squares and square roots. Or you could just have a coefficient on your parametric, and that's pretty awesome. Um, furthermore, say you wanted to move this circle up or down. Well, that's another situation where you'd have to like complete the square, right? But if I want to move this circle up, let's see if I can just move it up by one. Uh, oh well, I'm sorry. I moved it over by one. How did I do it? I added a 1 to the x-coordinates. So when you have x and y working separately, and let's move the let's move this next one up by 2, so I'll add 2, uh, t, wait, comma, 2, plus. When you have your x and y controlled separately, like imagine those cool robots, then it's easy to take your shape and move it up or down, right? So I can just do b, add slider. I can move this shape up or down as much as I want so much easier than completing the square, for example, uh, to create, to move these shapes around. And you can do that with any kind of parametric, but it's really, really nice with circles. There's this sense where actually, I think, not just polar, not even polar, but parametric is the natural way for circles to be graphed, or the most efficient way for circles to be graphed. Uh, and that's kind of the beauty. So uh, this little segment has been how to do this on Desmos, and some of the cool stuff that you can do with uh, parametrics. You can make a couple sliders. To make a slider, right, you just have to put in a, a number here. And you can see all these things stretch around. And I want to show you some of the other cool stuff you can do uh, just with trig parameterizations. Oh, let's put some sliders in there. Sure. Um, you can change the amplitude of your trig function. And I might have to make that like a little bigger. You can get some pretty cool parametric shapes if you change the period of the function. So they're not oscillating in synchronization anymore, right? This is now oscillating cosines, oscillating uh, more slowly than the sine is oscillating. So they're not going to match up to make a perfect circle. These make something called a uh, Lisa Zhu box, I think is called. Uh, and you can make these, there we go. Pretty fancy, depending on, um, you know, what kind of period changes you actually create. So that's another thing that people really love about parametrics is the cool graphs that you can make with trig and stuff and especially on Desmos they just graph so easily. So I'd recommend if you're interested get yourself on Desmos uh, you just plot it like a point right t comma t squared and uh, play around put some trig in there uh, put you know you can put a you can put a square on stuff oh look at look at look at that you can put a square on stuff see how that changes it um, and just mess around and I, I really encourage that. All right, so now let's do a couple example problems like you would see in your textbook. Uh, so the I've, I've taken this directly from our book. It says, eliminate the parameter t. Okay, we know what to do there. Then use the rectangular equation to sketch the plane curve. Use arrows to show the orientation of the curve uh, corresponding to increasing values for t. If an interval for t is not specified, assume that t is between negative infinity and infinity. And here there's no interval for t specified. Uh, I'm going to do exactly what they said. I'm first going to eliminate the parameter. So we have x equals root t and y is t plus 1. I think it might be easiest to solve this one for t. So let's make y minus 1 equal to t. And now I can take this t and plug it in for here. So I can say x is the square root of y minus 1 because that was uh, originally equal to t. So I've taken that and plugged it in. Uh, and then I could say, well, that's not really solved for y, so I could square both sides and get x squared equals y minus 1, and I could add 1 and get x squared plus 1 equals y. Now that, I know exactly what the graph is. It's a parabola with a vertical shift of 1. I'm going to draw it in dotted lines at first, 
because there's a couple subtleties that I want you to notice out of here. I didn't just choose this problem because it looked nice. Uh, let's imagine that I was making an in-out table. So I'm going to have t, x, y. And this was root t, and this is t plus 1. Um, you sh you're going to have to make a, such a table anyway because, because you uh, need to establish the direction of the curve. I don't actually know if this curve is going to the left or going to the right or how fast it's going or anything about it. Uh, but let's put a couple of values. So if t is negative 1, let's just do negative 1, 0, and 1 as examples, right? Just three easy values. They didn't say what, uh, so I'm going to pick the three smallest values. So negative 1, oh no, square root of negative 1, and then that'd be 0, but that's undefined. And so even if a, you might run into this in a problem, even if it says, oh, oh, there's no boundary on t, you might have something in your equation that implies, that has a domain itself on t. So whenever you see that square root, you know that t needs to be greater than 0 because of the square root that's shown up in there. So always something to look for. So that actually means it's undefined. And what that means is that this whole section of the curve is not going to be there uh, because t needs to be that larger than 0. So I'm going to start here. Um, square root of 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So I have the point 0, 1. That's here. And I have the point 1, 2. That's here. And that tells me, since this is the first point and this is the second point, that the increasing values for t actually go this way. And the directionality on the curve looks like this. Now, since the uh, t has to be greater than 0, but it didn't get an upper bound, you can just put an arrow on the end and say, yes, this continues off infinitely up. But you do have to figure out the direction, and there should be no curve on the other side. Let's look at another one. Um, so here I have bounds on t, 0 to 9. Um, I do have a square root t, so that is going to tell me that just by the domain here, t needs to be greater than or equal to 0, although I've taken care of that with the bounds as well. Uh, I don't know why I said that. I'm just going to... Oh, no, no, no. I know what I did. So this tells me t is greater than 0. Sometimes in bounds, you are going to see a strict inequality. Strict means uh, less than, not less than, or equal to. And so I wanted to show you what to do with that. Um, that still means you should. we're going to plug in 0. Uh, so I'm going to make my in out. Um, I have two choices. I could eliminate the parameter first to get a sense of what this looks like, or I could just go ahead and make the in-out table. I'm going to end up doing both. Um, I'm going to make the in-out table first. So my in is t, my out is x equals negative t plus 1, and my y is square root of t. I definitely want to plug in 0. I definitely want to plug in 9. I also notice that I'm taking square roots here, so I'm not just going to plug in every t between 0 and 9, because that's going to give me some pretty gross numbers. Uh, but how about 1? I'm going to pick 4, because I know the square root of 4, and I think, I think that's all I want to plug in, because uh, I don't have any other nice square roots. So negative 0 plus 1 is 1. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0, so this is actually getting kind of interesting. Negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3 because what it ends up doing is negative 4 plus 1 when I plug 4 into this equation. And negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8. So here we have a situation where, and you can see what's happening, the x is actually decreasing. That's going to affect our curve in a very interesting way. Um, square root y, that's going to be a square root of 0, 0. Square root of 1 is 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so let's plot these points out very carefully. And I had to draw my axis a little off-center to fit all the points. So I first have 1, 0. Then I have 0, 1. Okay, that's fine so far. Then I have negative 3 up to 2. Then I have negative 8, so 3, 6, 7, 8 up to 3. And then I'm going to stop. Um, so now I would connect from the starting point now, when I draw the starting point, I want to remember what I said, which is that the bound on t is actually less than, uh, t is greater than 0, not equal. So how do you deal with that? Well, you do kind of just like on a number line, put an open circle there. The open circle means that that point is, that the line approaches that point, right? If t is 0 0.001, we're basically at that point, but we're at t equals 0, we're not actually going to be at that point. 
And then we connect in the direction shown. And this one had an upper bound, so we stopped, but we put arrows kind of along the path to show the direction of uh, travel. Two arrows is plenty. You don't need a ton of arrows. So uh, why is it only going the other direction, by the way? What, what caused that? Well, it was specifically the negative on the T. So if you're ever doing a parameterization and you would like your curve to go the other way, put a negative on your T. It's a really nice trick um, to see. All right, and let's see if we can uh, eliminate the parameter and check on this. So if I have x is negative t plus 1, then uh, I guess I could add t and subtract x and get x is uh, negative, that's wrong, t is negative x plus 1, right, just adding and subtracting around. Um, and then I could plug that in for the y, and that would be y is the square root of negative x plus 1 which we actually do know how to graph that. It's the square root of negative paren x minus 1 is the way I like to think about it, which means it's a shift. It's a reflection first, so that's why it's pointing towards the left, and then it is a shift uh, one unit to the right, which is why the vertex is here at 1. Uh, so eliminating the parameter, if you know, it can be useful if you remember how to graph transformations like that, and it's uh, a really good use of those transformations. So that was pretty cool. And here I also wanted to show you how we could use our calculator to check our work. Uh, so we've been doing, we showed you on Desmos, of course, but maybe you don't have Desmos with you. Uh, you know, maybe you're out in the woods and you didn't bring your laptop, but you did bring your graphing calculator because you're always prepared uh, for a, a graph situation and you wanted a calculator. So how do you do it? Well, we got your calculator up. I just opened it up. Uh, first, you press mode. We got... Uh, if you're doing trig, make sure you're in radians or degrees properly, probably radians. And then go down here where it says function. And par, pole, sec. Pole we used before, that's polar mode. Par is not for playing golf. That's for parametric. So hit enter. It'll be in parametric mode. And then you can go to your, uh, you can quit out. It doesn't matter. You can go to your y equals. And look what you see. You have x1 of t, y1 of t. So, and now you're like, where's the T button, Mr. Eck? Well, the T is this magical thing here where it says X, T, theta, N, right? When it's in rectangular mode, it gives you an X. When it's in polar mode, it gives you a theta. And when it's in parametric mode, that button gives you a T. So I can do negative T plus 1. Hit enter. And I can do the square root of T. Now let's see what our graph looks like. Lovely, uh, but I notice that there's only a little bit of the graph and it doesn't really match. It doesn't go all the way out to negative eight. It doesn't go up to two. So when you're doing this, it's important to go to your, I believe it's in the window. Yeah, it's in your window settings and check your T min and max. Your T min and max are the, the bounds on T that are given to you here. T min is zero. The max was set to 6.28. That's two pi. Uh, set that to nine, right? Make it match the problem. T step is how frequently, it's basically how often it plots things in the table. So if your T step is too large, uh, well, I don't know, let's just actually plot it first. So that's what your graph should look like. You'll notice, by the way, that this does show you the direction because it draws it in order, but it doesn't show you any open and closed circles. So again, the calculator is not actually as smart as you, a person. Um, uh, What else are we doing? Oh, what if you change your T step to be something that's too big, like three? Then it's going to basically plot a value every three units. And your graph starts to look pretty boring. Uh, maybe make it make our t-step 5. It's basically the resolution on your graph, right? Like, so if your, your graph is, your t-step is too large, your resolution will not be very good. If your t-step is too small, nothing bad will happen. It'll just take too long to graph. Oh, what? If your t-step is too small, your uh, calculator won't like you. You can't have it be 0. None of this is important, by the way. It could potentially take too long to graph. Yeah, so this is what happens if you set it to be too small. It's just taking its time, putting a lot of values on the table, and uh, taking its time graphing, which is not very exciting, so we're not going to watch that happen. Um, but that's how you do it in the calculator. Put it in parametric mode, type it in, adjust your window. That's it. That's all you need to do. We're almost done with parametrics. I'm just going to make this one epic video, uh, not even try to cut it. Um, the last thing that you might have to do is also the thing that students find the most challenging, but I actually think is, is not very challenging 
Uh, but what's tricky about it is that you have to make some decisions. You, it's not just a recipe. You actually have to, to make choices. And that is parameterizing a plane curve. So uh, the problem might look like this. It might say, write two sets of parametric equations for the curve y equals 2x plus 1. And uh, when we say curve, we mean right, like line or curve. I know there's an i in that. Um, so that's just a general term. Uh, the way I do it first is I think about what this originally would be. So it would be 2x plus 1 from x between 0 and 2. So at x equals 0. So this is just a rectangular equation. It's a line. It's a, it's a line with a slope of 2 and an intercept of 1. So it would start here and would go up with a slope of 2. Oh, I made that too far up. Go up with a slope of 2 until it ended right here. And specifically, I would mean then I have starting point 0, 1, and ending point 2, 5. And it's important to have those starting and ending points because when we choose our bounds on t, we're going to have to match those. Okay, so that's step one, is I investigate the original curve and understand what it looks like. And this one looks like a line. Then uh, you have to choose a parameterization for x, and it's this, this part where you have to choose that often trips uh, people up. But the trick is this. Almost always, 97% of the time, made up statistic, uh, x equals t is going to be the easiest parameterization to choose. So let's check this out. Um, my parameterization 1 is going to be r of t equals, I'll make a little bracket, and I'll say x of t equals t. Now let's think about what would happen here in an in-out table, right? I would have t, I would have x equals t, and I'd have y equals, I don't know, something. Well, what t would I need to have x start at 0, right? I want x to start at 0 and go to 2. So what if t starts at 0 and goes like t, 1, 2? Then x would go 0, 1, 2. And what that means is that your bounds on t can be the same as the bounds on x. And so once you've identified, you've chosen a parameterization, you can then say, okay, this is going to tell me that t needs to go between 0 and 2 to make the x part work. And now that I know some initial values for uh, t, I can pick a y parameterization that also causes those to work. So I need uh, something where I put in 0 and I get out 1. Well, what's that going to be? How about 2x plus 1? So if x is equal to t, you can just let y equal 2t plus 1. And let's check how that works. So that's going to be 1, 3, and 5. So does my graph go through the points? 0, 1, 1, 3, and 2, 5? Yes, it does. And so I guess I have to write it inside the function. Uh, y of t, that's y, equals 2t plus 1. And you have now successfully parameterized a line. You have an x parameterization, you have a y parameterization, and you have bounds. And those bounds match with the original. You can also check by seeing if when you eliminate the parameter, if you get back the original. Uh, so let's do that here. If x is t and y is 2t plus 1, then when you eliminate the parameter by plugging x in here, you get y equals 2x plus 1, which was your original and that was your goal. So that's a really helpful thing when you're looking at parameterization. I want to show you one more trick, which is how you could make your line go backwards, right? So the direction of travel on the one we just did was forwards and up as t progressed, x progressed. What if you wanted your line to go backwards? Then the trick is this. Let x of t equal negative t. That is, so uh, t is going to decrease. Then uh, you have, you'll have to adjust your y of t. So let's see. So what does x of t need to do? Um, actually, here's what I like to do. I need x to go from 2. If I want the line to go that way, I need x to go from 2 down to 0. I can still use the bounds. Turn that off. Uh, 0 is less than t is less than equal to 2. But if I wanted to start at 2, I could do x of t is equal to 2 minus t. 
that means that's going to cause this to start at x equals 2 and decrease. And then I will also need the y of t. y is going to need to start at 5 and go back down to 1. So how could I do that? Well, I guess I could do... So I've decided if I decided that I'm starting t at 0, then when t is 0, my y of t needs to be 0. So I could do 5 as my kind of like base value. And then how about minus 2? t. So I have 2 minus t and 5 minus 2t. And you just, this is, again, where people find this challenging is you kind of have to like guess and check and adjust. Um, but will this go from 5 to 1 as t goes from 0 to 2? Yeah, it will because when t is 0, I'm doing 5 minus 0. When t is 2, I'm doing 5 minus 4, which is 1. So this is an example of a parameterization and t bounds where t can still be increasing, but your line because you have some minus t's, it's actually going the other way. And that's a really helpful trick uh, in, in calculus. I use this all the time in multivariable calculus because sometimes you have a curve, maybe it's in two pieces where you have a parabola that goes up this way, and then from the parabola endpoint, you have to go back to your starting point along a line, and so your line has to, has to go the other way to make this a smooth loop. And if you don't know how to switch the direction of a line, then you, you have a hard time making that a smooth loop. So that's kind of where that shows up. Um, now in Math 4, do you really worry about this? Not a lot. Um, it's kind of an advanced parameterizing trick. Okay, this has been a long video, so I wanted to do a little recap. Um, takeaways on parametrics. They let you have a function where x and y are determined by a hidden parameter. Uh, parametric graphs have something that other graphs don't, which is a direction, a start point, and an end point. If you have a parametric equation, you can eliminate t using algebra to see what the graph would look like in terms of x and y, although this is not always possible. Parametrics are useful uh, in all kinds of applications that involve motion uh, because there's just a lot of physical properties where the x component of motion and the y component of motion are completely separate. Honestly, one I didn't mention before is just gravity, right? Gravity always acts straight down, so if you're throwing a ball kind of on an angle, uh, you know, the gravity is acting straight down. That's like a, a parameterization that's just affecting its y component, and the x component's unaffected. So uh, physicists use parameterization all the time when they're dealing with physical components. Uh, programmers use it. Uh, a lot of robots and computers use it. It's just a very cool thing uh, for studying that sort of thing. Uh, you can also do parametrics on your calculator, and you can do them on Desmos if you know how to program it in. It's not very hard on either of them, but it does take a little bit of practice. Um, so that's, that's about all I want to say on parametrics. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know this one was a little long. I'll try to put some timestamps in the bottom. Um, please let me know what questions you have, and I will see you guys next time.